Well, hello. And high drama as normal in the Warner kitchen. I thought when I was passing the fish shop the other day, look at that leviathan of a squid. Look at that super fresh squid. We're going to do stuffed squid. With the most intense and gorgeous chili sauce with lots of odd bits and bobs in it. Okay, but the squid, look at this beautiful thing, 20,000 leagues under the sea. Look at this wonderful thing. Can just sit over here for a bit because we've got some things to do first. Okay, so the stuffing. People are scared of squid, don't they? People are scared of squid, what, when they're in the water or when they're in the kitchen? Um, it's a squid, the Humboldt squid that lives down in the inky depths. That is to be scared of, the one that the sperm whales dive to eat. But a thing like this, they are pretty ferocious though, when you fish for squid, but they're kind of extraordinary weird things. They're from another planet. They came here on a spaceship and settled and now get eaten, unfortunately, but they're just quite unlike anything else. Octopus, squid, cuttlefish, they're the most extraordinary things. Um, but they're pretty tasty. Um, so one large onion and not a gnarly little Spanish yellow onion that's all tough. You want something really soft, tender and giving. And this is a white onion. It's my favorite. It's very gentle in taste. It cooks to extremely tender. Oh, by the way, how many flipping cookbooks? Have you read that say cook the onions until tender and then it goes five to six minutes? That's absolute nonsense. You cannot get an onion tender in five to six minutes. And I'd say it's always gonna take you 10 to 12. This knife I'm using has actually got a handle made from a bedpost. It was made by a friend of mine. Made from a bedpost from a famous house in Dorset called Ford Abbey. So when is a knife not a knife? Well when you've got a handle that was a bedpost and the idea that in the 18th century people might have been romping and giggling on top of my knife handle, well, that makes it quite an exciting knife. Okay, clean as you go. Butter, as far as I'm concerned, is a health product. It certainly makes me happy. Tom -ti tom now what else are we gonna need? We are going to need some bay leaves, follow me. You think that squid's large? Look at my bay tree. <laughs> nice big fat bay leaf. The more you can pick yourself, the more you have to do with your food. The more I catch something or pick something and wander into the garden, you're in touch with nature. And this is what I feel we're losing. For all the food programs, for all the cookbooks, for all the chefs wanging on all the time about what they believe about everything, we actually know less about food than we ever have. Um, so the more you touch it, the more you feel it, the more you interact with nature, the better. I want a little oregano. It's a really punchy herb oregano and you can overdo it, so not too much. This is ground coriander, probably about a teaspoon. Okay, a good whack of black pepper. I was gonna chop some garlic for this, but this week I made some confit garlic. Couldn't be simpler. It's basically simmering whole cloves of garlic with some salt, totally submerged in olive oil. And in this case, I've put some rosemary in there because I picked a branch saw it going dry and getting sad and left out in my kitchen. So I put that in with the garlic. Ingredients have feelings, by the way. My fishing rods have feelings. I'm fishing on Saturday and one of them will be saying, oh, but you always take that one with you. Why do you never take me fishing? So then I feel bad and then I take that one and maybe not have such a good day because, you know, but I, I'm a very deeply sentimental individual. So these onions have got to be cooked until they are really tender. So I'm going to turn them down and turn my attention to something else. So the stuffing for the squid. So I'm using panko breadcrumbs. And the reason I'm using these in the stuffing is if you just do the pure sausage meat, it could be just a little bit tight and tough. Um, so you want to make it all kind of juicy. And then into the breadcrumbs, I'm going to pour a little bit of milk. 
And then, while those are going, don't forget to, onions need attention. They are the backbone of so many dishes, so look after them. These are not from Italian butcher, but nonetheless, they are Italian style fennel sausages of utter deliciousness. So those are going to be going into the stuffing. Have a zest of half a lemon. Lemon zest just really goes bazing. It wakes things up. I want to just toast a few walnuts. So I'm going to give them a rough chop. Um, and if you don't have the nuts, it's really not going to bugger up the recipe. So just leave them out. But I always put them in this. Okay, so parsley. In it goes. I'm just going to have another sip of my weapons grade coffee. Oh, walnuts are burning. I just want them to lightly toast, not over darken. Okay, walnuts in. Okay, and we're nearly there with the stuffing. They've cooked for 10 or 12 minutes, I said, but are they tender? So, I'm guess what I'm saying, not quite yet. All in all, is use your senses in the kitchen. We've come to rely so much on timings, what we're told to do, but actually cooking is a big touchy-feely kind of existence. How do you know they're tender? By getting a spoon and sticking them in your mouth. They shouldn't be crunchy, they should be what I'd call utterly pathetic. <laughs> Probably about half of the onions. I'm gonna let them cool down before I mix this up. We'll come back to this in a minute. We're gonna get on with the sauce. So we've got a squid, and we've got what's going in the squid. But now we have to make an all-important sauce. Chilies. You can get all these amazing chilies, and you think, oh, they've been dried, they're dead. If you save these seeds and you plant them, they will grow. Um, so I'm just, we always do a mix, because I always mix them up. We never quite know what's going to pop out the other end. But I always save the chili seeds. And I really only, Mexican ones in my house is normally guajillo, which is kind of red, amazing, really used for the color, but also kind of vibrant, fruity taste. And the ancho, which is a kind of mahogany, kind of, you know, makes me think of kind of leather and chocolate and prunes and things like that. So I'm using guajillo and ancho. Um, this is kind of deep and funky, and this is vibrant and highly colored. They all start green and then ripen to red, and then when they're dried, these extraordinary kind of flavor profiles come out, which are very different in all of them. Um, so these have got very, very separate tastes. If you sat down to these and nibbled on them, you'd say, that is ancho, that's guajillo, that's chipotle, that's pasilla de Oaxaca, that's, you know, what a cascabel, that's whatever the case may be. Okay, so these chilies need to be toasted. What you don't want to see is smoke. If you see smoke, you'll be burning your chilies and they'll take on a bitter taste. So I just tear them up and then just kind of keep them on the move. And they'll slightly change in color. They'll take on a kind of tawny. If you married a vegetable, it would be a chili by the hand. If I married a, no, I, if I married a vegetable, I would marry a broad bean they're all cosy and woolly inside. You can climb in and rummage around in the sleeping bag. <laughs> and they're so flipping delicious. So you can smell this intensely wonderful warming. Do you remember those? I always do. You touch the chilies and then you go, oh, I'm just going to nip to the loo. Um, need I say more? Okay. So we're going to kind of hurry these chilies, so to speak. I need some tomato puree. Ah, doglet. Is she interested in food? Is my dog interested in food? Is our dog interested in food? Um, Aggie has, knows her way around a cheese board, quite unlike any other dog. Um, she has tried oysters. She's tried razor clams. She's tried langoustine. She's tried scallops. She's had quail. She's had snipe. She's had grouse. She's had chicken. I'd say that never was such a gastronomic dog um, known. Right, okay, tomato puree. 
What I'd normally do, um, oh, we've got the time. We've got the time, haven't we, Paul? We're not in a rush. I like tomato puree for such things as this sauce when it's scalded. By the way, if you hear that bouncing sound, it's dog wanting to play ball. That's not gonna happen. So what I'm gonna do is I actually wanna burn the tomato puree to get a nicer taste out of it. You just quite simply put it dry into a pan and cook it till it starts to catch. It just gives it, takes away that slightly processed taste, gives it a little bit more kind of depth and oomph. You heard that noise. <laughs> it's relentless. Right, okay, so that's going in with the chilies. Some hot water. Bay leaf out. We've got onions and garlic. I don't want any, I always feel sorry for any ingredients that get left behind. A chef I worked for and I absolutely loved, Alistair Little, who sadly no longer. Um, you'd be scraping something into a pan out of another pot or scraping it from one thing to another. And he'd see a little trace of custard or a little bit of sauce. He'd say in his Yorkshire accent, is there anything wrong with that bit? And you go, no. And he went, well, you can put it in then. Are you trying to say something about Yorkshire people? Thrifty people. And we all should be. Um, what was I going to And a little bit, I always put it in at any stage, but just a tiny bit of coffee in the sauce, which I'm going to add now. It's the end of the coffee pot. Just about a tablespoon. Normally you'd leave the chilies to soak for a really good long time, but because this blender is so powerful, with the boiling water in here too, it will um, rehydrate it all very quickly. Pan back on, heat on. bay leaf back in, two whole star anise. Star anise are just beautiful. I mean, nature by design, color, function, just kind of beats everything we do in fashion or, you know, I look to nature for everything. Um, whether it's a little two foot at my feet, seeing what's going on in a wood, or it's some huge vista in front of me in Norway, nature is everything to me. Um, infinitely beautiful, always captivating. Um, Sherry and some sherry vinegar. Because you want that little bit of edge, a tiny little bit of cocoa powder, which goes really well with the chilies, all from the same place, Central America. We want to get a little bit of integration, so I want that to come up to a simmer. And I'm gonna take a kind of tentative amount of salt. Remember that you can put salt in, but you can't take it out. So you can always add more later, but be careful. And one thing I forgot to put in, the smoked element, very important. Um, so this is good old Spanish smoked paprika. And I want a good teaspoon of that. It lends a slight smokiness. And, right. On that, on its own, that's fascinating and tasty. It needs a little bit of sweetening. Also remember that actually squid, when it's cooked, the juices are quite sweet. So I don't want to add too much sugar, but nonetheless, I want a little bit of brown sugar. I want to keep that dark color, so brown sugar, not white sugar. And of course it has that more kind of tarry you know, kind of taste, if you know what I mean, closer to molasses. It looks good, this looks, just visually. Yes, well, that's a good point you make, Paul, because some of the world's great dishes are not particularly pretty but you don't judge them for that, you judge them for their taste. Whereas some things are delicious and also very beautiful. And that is a stunning color. And now it's time for all things squid. A lot of squid that you'll find in the shops, they'll have stripped all the skin off and they'll sell it to you like a white tube. I don't have a problem with that, it's tasty. My issue with it is though, that all this lovely pink membrane on the top is incredibly tasty. And when you fry a squid hard, lots of sugars weep out of this and you end up with a kind of, if only you could bag it up, but a kind of salty, crispy, sea toffee. 
I can't explain it in any way, but it's super umami, super salty, super sweet. It's almost like a candy, a savory candy. It's flipping delicious. So I always ask um, the fishmonger, please don't um, clean it. I'll do it myself. Just in front of the eye is where you want to make a cut. So I'm gonna cut that. And then you open that up. And this is what, they don't have a mouth, they have a beak like a Look at that, it's super sharp, a beak like a bird. So that can come out. I like things to look like what they are as a cook. So I'm actually just gonna divide this in half. So two halves, there we go. Right, you then look at this. This in effect is what keeps the squid, this is the squid structure. On a cuttlefish, it's that big white thing on the beach that you give to your budgerigar. That's really annoying that that one's actually already snapped. Uh, and then I'm going to pull this out, which is all the internal parts. But this bit often ends up in the bin. And there's two really big fingers of meat there, which I want to save. This shiny little sack here is the squid's ink sack. So I'm also gonna keep that, and that will go in my stash of squid ink sacks for when I want to make a dark rice or a, you know, a black pasta or something like that. There's the other part of the, what squid keeps its structure. Oh, look, ha ha, that is brilliant. This, we couldn't have, ah, we couldn't have asked for more. Look, squid's dinner. They're ferocious hunters, these things. Kind of cool, huh? It's violent out there. <laughs> this squid is quite sandy inside and you make a delicious dish and then you eat it and you go, hold on a minute. It was really tasty, but it was flipping sandy. And just wash it out. Yeah. Now, the only thing I'm gonna remove are these, which are basically their paddles, which they steer with and motor along with as well. So they've got two, you see. So these are definitely going to get fried and cooked with it. But I want them out for just so it's nice and evenly turned over when during the cooking. Stuff it. Okay. I'm pushing it down to the ends. You've still got a lot of cavity to fill here. You literally just stuff it. Yeah. But the great thing is, sorry, slightly trying to force too much in there. The great thing is that when this is cooked, stuffing's cooked and the squid's cooked. You can slice this in perfect little rings um, without it falling apart. Make sure it's all even. Now, we've got to secure this because we don't want the squid busting open. So we're kind of securing it. Okay. Now, this is all getting very exciting because we're at that point where it's all gonna start cooking. This is cast iron. It's a very famous Swedish brand, this. Um, they're brilliant pans. And every time you eat out of cast iron, Nicholas Ekstedt, the famous Swedish chef, told me that um, you get iron in the food. So when his wife had, her, I think, their second child, um, they went to give her the uh, test to give her iron supplements after giving birth. And they said, what's wrong with you? You don't need any. And it's because Nicholas always cooks out of cast iron and she was so iron rich um, that she didn't need any postnatal supplements. Cool, hey? Okay, a good neutral oil that can get to a high heat. So I'm using sunflower oil, which is my normal go-to. A little bit of salt. Okay, I'm going in. We want some proper color on this. It's kind of like eating almost. It's kind of like umami steam of the sea and sugars and fresh fish and that squid thing that only squid and octopus have. But the smell, it's kind of like you're sitting down to eat already. It's just phenomenal. And it's this stuff here I was talking about earlier, this kind of liquid, this pink liquid. It, with that, as that reduces and evaporates, it will turn into a kind of amazing toffee. Because there's a lot of water in the pan. So there's no point in turning it around if you can see liquid because you know it's still leaking. 
When the liquid goes is when you start to get the browning. Now that, this, all these little crispy bits are just, it's sugar, sugar and salt and sea. It's just epic. All in. It's all in. But when we serve it, of course, we'll put the tentacles back at the front and we'll put the paddles back at the side. Okay, there's good colour beginning to happen. Yeah, great. Can you smell that, Mr. Director? Right, so this has kind of picked up a nice lot of brown and I'm going to put the paddles in. There is so much flavour in the bottom of that pan and it should go back into the dish. Okay, now oven is on, it's on about 180 and that's gonna braise slowly for about an hour or just over until you should be able to literally slide a knife into that squid very easily. Right now, while that cooks, all that sausage meat inside, mixed with the squid meat, is gonna leak out. So it's kind of a wonderful, surfy, turfy joy. Adios. First time on the party bus? Yeah, yeah. me too. Party, 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 all about the party bus. Woo! Party, 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 party. Ah! <coughs> Silly sausages. <laughs> Squid aroma. Okay. Oh my good lord, look at the colour of that sauce. Well done, Val. Um, that is exquisite. It's got sweetness of sherry. It's got a slight on the back of the throat um, from the chilies. It's got real depth from the addition of that little bit of um, cocoa powder and a little bit of coffee. You don't want to serve something delicious and immediately impale your guests on the end of a tiny skewer. So remember to take the skewers out. And we got its flippers at the back. Everything kind of where it would be if the squid was still alive. A little bit of parsley, not too much. The moment of truth. Okay, the squid is just so tender. I want sauce, I want the filling. Chefs are always banging on about how good their cooking is, but that is flipping exquisite to the point. I want some sauce too. The squid is just meltingly tender, but it's still got some kind of, you know, texture to it. The walnuts are coming through that delicious sausage filling. A bit of a showstopper if you put that on the table for your guests. Dear all, we've been squid diddling, um, but if you want to go into the woods, go onto my Patreon site and learn how to make a delicious chestnut soup.